A while ago, I made a video on Sadhguru and his out of the world claims like There's substantial scientific evidence today about how the molecular structure of the water can be rearranged without changing the chemical structure, even with a simple thought or a touch. A lot of the people in my comment section were seriously offended by what I said. And many of them mentioned someone called Masaru Moto who has provided substantial evidence that water has memory. Like always, this guy couldn't help but figure out what the actual story behind this fiasco was. Well, if not for this deep dive, how could I have possibly known that water has feelings and you can hurt water's feelings by yelling at it? Yeah, you heard that right, that's something that actually happens in the story. Also, what would happen if there was a million dollar prize for anyone who could prove that water actually remembers what was dissolved in it. This is also the story of a long drawn out controversy involving a scientist, a journal, a magician and that million dollar reward. Hi, my name is Pranav and you're watching Science is Dope. The story of the fraudulent idea of water memory has two parts. The first starts with a French immunologist named Jacques Benveniste. The year was 1988 and Benveniste published a paper in Nature, one of the most prestigious scientific journals. The publication of this paper marked the beginning of one of the most infamous controversies in science, known as the Benveniste Affair. So what was actually there in that paper? Well, Benveniste and his team claimed that they had experimental evidence that water had memory. The study talks about white blood cells that are responsible for hypersensitivity. These cells responded to a particular antibody called anti-IgE. Benveniste and his team found that such white blood cells continue to show their effect even when a solution containing that antibody was diluted so much that no antibody was physically present in the solution. So they concluded that water can remember the biological activity of a substance by acting as a template of the molecule that was once dissolved in it even after extreme dilution, even after that molecule was no longer present. Now obviously this was a huge jump in logic to make this conclusion from this evidence because the evidence itself was weak and the study was not rigorous enough. It had flaws in methodology. When he tried publishing the article in the journal Nature, it wasn't really a smooth process. We'll talk about that in a second but first let's talk about how this paper gained support. The biggest group supporting this conclusion was the alternative medicine folks, particularly the homeopaths. Because of a statement he made in the original paper, you have to shake the solution vigorously when you're diluting. Sounds familiar? Because it is. This is the same principle that homeopaths have been using for ages. Homeopaths saw this as a validation for their methods. Who needs an active molecule if water itself can remember how the medicine works? Benveniste did not stop with just this paper. He started a company called DigiBio, a digital biology laboratory whose aim was to revolutionize medicine by uh, digitizing the memory retained by water. He believes this digitizing uh, enabled cures to be stored in hard drives and then transmitted uh, via telephone wires or as an attachment in an email over the internet. So all a patient had to do to get cured by medicine was to take a glass of water near the computer and then open the email attachment having the memory of the medicine. The digital signal would then electromagnetically activate the water and turn it into the cure they want. Amazing concept but do things in the world actually work that way? As we say on this channel, if you make an extraordinary claim then you need extraordinary evidence to back it up. Did Benveniste have this extraordinary evidence? Nope. In the study published in Nature, neither does Benveniste provide uh, convincing evidence for his claims nor does he provide a mechanism to explain what he was observing. Soon after this study came out, it received a lot of backlash from the scientific community for supporting pseudo-scientific ideas without providing any solid evidence. But on the other hand, believers in alternative medicine were rejoicing because they found their voice in a reputed immunologist who published, who apparently proved their claims uh, and published his findings in a prestigious journal like Nature. Nature's then editor, John Maddox, however, was expecting this chaos even before publishing the paper. After an extensive review process, which took way longer than usual, Nature agreed to uh, publish this paper under the condition that their independent researchers would investigate the findings of the study. To make sure that they're not misleading their readers, there is an editor's note at the end of the paper that there is no physical 
historical basis for this activity and uh, nature would investigate to see if uh, the observations are accurate. This incident was odd because you wouldn't find an editor's uh, note along with a published paper. Now, when you think of a scientific investigation, who comes to mind? A team of scientists in lab coats? How about a magician? Yeah, you heard me right. A magician. When he was just 13 years old, James Randi met with a bicycle accident and he was bedridden for months. During this time, he fell in love with the world of magic and illusions. After he recovered, he took up performing magic tricks and daring escape stunts as a profession. One of his most famous performances was where he broke the famous Harry Houdini's record by spending 104 minutes inside a swimming pool locked away in a metal coffin. But James Randi was not your everyday magician. For someone whose profession was to create illusions, James Randi Shaw hated tricking people. One of his greatest passions was exposing scammers and pseudoscience peddlers who were trying to make a quick buck by tricking people. He toured across the globe to reveal the tricks that faith healers, psychics, uh, diviners, etc. used to fool vulnerable people and debunked faulty scientific claims regarding the paranormal. So the journal's editor, John Maddox, who was already suspicious of the claims Ben Venice was making, thought he should bring in this champion debunker, this expert in expose, James Randi himself, uh, to provide a new perspective on this whole thing. Along with Maddox and Randi, Nature also appointed Dr. Walter Stewart, who was a scientific malpractice expert, and a lab technician, Jose Alvarez, to join the investigation team. The team soon visited Benveni's lab in Paris and after a whole week of investigation found that one, the results weren't replicable when they used a double blind method and they used the same procedure in the same lab and the same instruments. There were a lot of systematic errors in the study including observer's bias. They also found out that the salary of two members of Benveni's lab was being paid by a French pharmaceutical company that made homeopathic medicines. This is a huge conflict of interest. It's like tobacco companies funding research to prove that cigarettes were weren't addictive. Now, after all this, you know what Ben Venice did? He refused to retract his original paper. So, Nature published its own paper. It was called High Delusion Experiments A Delusion. And they published all their findings. I have to give props for that title. The verdict of the investigation was welcomed by the scientific community, but Ben Venice, of course, refused to accept any of this. And what followed was a Twitter war of the era. Uh, but instead of tweets, there were entire articles. It's been 30 years since Benveni's first came up with his claims and no one has been able to definitively prove any of what he said. Oh, and remember the million dollar prize money that I mentioned in the beginning? Well, James Randi set up this prize pool for anyone who could show any evidence for Benveni's theory. Many people tried and failed. The BBC's program Horizon once broadcasted an episode where uh, there was a team trying to win Randy's prize and they failed. His challenge remains unbeaten to this date. Though not for the money, I'm guessing, uh, the US Department of Defense even tried their hand at uh, Benveniste's uh, experiments but couldn't find anything conclusive. But the story doesn't end there. Just when the world thought that hoaxes like water memory were gone, rose the great water whisperer Masaru Emoto who said that you can change the structure of water depending on your emotions. If memory wasn't enough, water now also has feelings. I hate you. You're an idiot. You're the worst. Oh, um, why did I yell a bunch of things at my glass of water? Because I want to see if I could hurt its feelings and see what it does to me then. Mm. Other than increasing my urge to pee. <laughs> Because according to Masaru Emoto, a Japanese scientist and author, the structure of water and the way it affects your body can be influenced by human emotions and intentions. In his best-selling book, Hidden Mistress in Water, published in 2004, he shows a bunch of photographs of ice crystals of different shapes and apparently this proves that if you take a glass of water and direct positive feelings at it, say positive things like I love you or expose it to beautiful classical music, then the water will turn to beautiful crystals 
on freezing. On the other hand, if you say expose it to a negative environment, uh, expose it to negative motions, like say things like uh, you are ugly, direct negative emotions uh, towards it or expose it to uh, music like say heavy metal, then it turns into ugly crystals on freezing. My question is, do it. Why can't I hate on heavy metal like that? I love heavy metal. Anyway, his work got a wider audience after his, after it was shown on a documentary called What the Bleep Do We Know? So what is so famous about his rice experiment? So Emoto added rice and water to three separate glass jars. And then for one month, he said thank you to the first one and you are an idiot to the second one and he completely ignored the third one. And after a month, he observed that the one he thanked uh, fermented with a sweet smell. The one he yelled at uh, turned black and the one he completely ignored began to rot. In another experiment, he asked 2000 people in Tokyo to direct positive feelings towards water samples kept 5000 miles away in California. The results showed that water formed beautiful crystals when frozen. So for him, this definitely proves that you can hurt water or change its properties by yelling at it or uh, saying nice things to it. At least that's what uh, the Hollywood flag bearer of quackery Gwyneth Paltrow believes in. See, this is how you should think about this. If anyone claims that water has memory, that's an extraordinary claim. And extraordinary claims are not automatically wrong. They just need extraordinary evidence to support them. And all this claim has is flimsy evidence like this. Whenever someone says something so unbelievable like water can remember what was dissolved in it, you shouldn't accept it on the base of flimsy evidence, weak evidence like what he's showing. We'll discuss why this is weak evidence in detail in a second. What you should have in mind when someone comes up with evidence like this is you should think to yourself, how is water listening to harsh words? Does it have ears? Is water multilingual? How does it understand both English and Japanese? He did yell in some Japanese. Maybe water can read labels also. Also, Emoto doesn't really mention these uh, jars were kept in separate rooms. Maybe they were in the same room. So if you shout to one jar of rice and water, won't the other jars hear it? So how would it know that it's not the one getting the hateful messages, it's the one that's gonna get the sweet loving messages. Things like this only begin to scratch the surface of how flawed this experiment was. There was no control to see if uh, other conditions like temperature, humidity, initial samples, uh, and whether it was free from disease, etc. Et these things weren't controlled for. Oh, did I mention that none of these experiments or results were mentioned in peer-reviewed journals? If they were, then their methodology, their results, and the way they try to remove bias from the experiment, all these would be thoroughly checked by scientists from other scientists from the same field. The only places where his scientific experiment was uh, reported was a self-published book and uh, a spirituality journal called Explore NY. Some of you must be thinking, hey Pranab, don't be so dismissive. He's a scientist with a PhD, so he must be the real deal. Well, uh, Dr. Masaru Emoto is a real doctor, like Dr. Dre is a real doctor. Emoto got his doctorate from the Open International University of Alternative Medicine in Tamil Nadu, a fake university that was raided in 2019 for functioning without any affiliation and giving out dozens of diplomas for money without conducting any proper class or exams. So yeah, there goes his doctorate. But there must be some truth to his claims, right? If not, how do we explain the beautiful and ugly crystals and the rotten rice? Those observations are nothing but a mixture of cherry picking results, clever use of physical conditions and sheer chance. Let's find out how. Snowflakes or ice crystals are formed when water is frozen. The freezing process brings water molecules closer together and they arrange themselves in a hexagonal shape because it's the most stable way for, the, for H2O molecules to arrange themselves. And scientists have been creating these extremely intricate looking snowflakes for ages used by carefully controlling temperature and humidity without the help of any good or bad words. Dr. Kenneth G. Lebrecht, the professor of physics at Caltech, who is also the snow 
snowflake expert, has been designing beautiful, unique snowflakes for decades and has also created this graph on how different shapes can be obtained by controlling the freezing conditions. Just as someone can grow good looking crystals using this technique, someone can also create ugly looking crystals. All you have to do is apply a bit of pressure or increase the temperature a little bit and this will break the delicate growth structure of the crystal and turn it into an ugly blob. Even if we consider that intentions actually affected the shape of the crystals in Emoto's experiment, why wasn't any scientist other than him able to repeat this experiment? Wanna know why? Because the methodology he mentions in his papers is extremely vague. He doesn't mention how the samples were protected from the intentions of the experimenter of the photographer taking those photographs. Also, the freezing temperatures he mentions for particular crystal shapes do not match well-researched and validated crystal growth trends as discovered in a later independent review of Emoto's work. Now moving on to cherry picking data, there's a very good chance that many of the uh, good intention crystals turned out to be ugly but he chose only the beautiful ones. The same way for the ugly crystals, he probably only chose the ugliest looking crystals, only chose to put their images in his book and said that they were ugly. The reason I think this is because in one of his studies, he mentions that he used 100 samples of water, but his results only show a fraction of that. Why isn't the entire image repository published somewhere? Maybe not in the original paper, but as supplementary data, like in most research papers. His knack for faulty methodology also applies to his rise in water experiments. Many independent enthusiasts and actual scientists with the real PhDs who tried recreating his experiments didn't see any difference between the good, the bad, and the ignored just. At one point, James Randi actually invited Masaru Moto to reproduce his, his experiments under controlled conditions for that $1 million price, but Randy never heard back from him. But listen, I actually wanted to give this water is affected by emotions uh, theory uh, an actual fair chance, which is why I drank that enchanted glass of water earlier. Since I'm about 60% water, something strange should have happened to me by now. I don't feel so good. But as you can see, it's the same old me. Now that we've established the fact that water doesn't have feelings, let's answer the main question. Does water have memory? If not, what? It all comes down to basic chemistry. Water is a polar molecule. That means negative charges on the molecule are slightly skewed towards oxygen. This creates a tiny negative charge on oxygen and an equal and opposite tiny positive charge on the hydrogens. These tiny positive charges on the hydrogens get attracted to the negative on another oxygen on another water molecule. And this happens throughout the body of water. This is called hydrogen bonding. In his paper, Ben Venice implies that water retains the memory of the substance that was dissolved in it by creating a template with the help of this infinite hydrogen bonded network. But here's the problem with that idea. These bonds are not permanent. They keep breaking and reforming in liquid water. Their lifetime is something around 10 power minus 11 seconds. So there is no way water can form a mold of the molecule that was once dissolved in it using uh, this hydrogen bonded network. What if water could actually hold on to the properties of the materials that were dissolved in water, that were in the water? Imagine all the things that had gone into water and water bodies. Uh, that would clearly do more harm than good. For those still thinking, why would Emoto and Benveniste go to such lengths to create such elaborate hoaxes? I mean, if not in the if not genuinely for science, then for what? Well, like every other scam, it boils down to business, money, and preying on vulnerable people. We always keep hearing that we need to stay hydrated to stay healthy. And that's true since every cell in our body requires water to function properly. So when you hear this advice to drink water every day, what if someone comes up and says, I can make every sip of water you drink even more beneficial than it is. Here it is, my magic mumbo jumbo that turns your water into a elixir. Benveniste tried to do that by creating a business around it with his digital biology laboratory and transmitting cures via the internet into your water. Similarly, Masaru Emoto not only sold numerous copies of his book with all the all this ridiculous stuff, but he also made money from products like indigo water and healing cards and collaborations with multiple wellness and specialized water brands. He even trademarked his own name. We also have the homeopaths who try to validate their ideas using this and of course your friendly neighborhood. Not a godman. 
If you think this is the only fraudulent idea around water, then you are wrong. We have magnetized structured water, raw water, unfiltered and untreated from a natural source, which is just a recipe for waterborne diseases, moon water infused from the energy of a full moon, and of course, celebrity favorites like alkaline water. Each of these products makes extraordinary claims about health benefits without extraordinary evidence to back them up. So just drink the water, the drinkable water your municipality provides or what you get from the purifier in your house because your body doesn't care if water has memory or if it's happy or if its feelings are hurt. All you have to take care of is make sure it's free from contaminants. If you want me to cover other bottled water industry fads like alkaline water, just leave them in the comments below. Also videos like these are expensive to make. If you do like my work, support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee or YouTube memberships. If you like this video, you might also like this one I did on a scam that came on Shark Tank India. I'll see you in the next one. Till then remember, science is dope.